Hello everyone to our last session of the climate change program. Today we're going to talk about global food security challenges with Dr. Emma Stevens. I would like to start with a short bio of Emma. Uh, Dr. Emma Stevens is currently working as a bioeconomist in the science and technology branch of the Canadian Federal Government Ministry of Agriculture. She works in the Prairie region as part of Agroecological Systems Research Group, examining economic issues in the sustainable intensification of agriculture. Some ongoing projects include evaluating the economic value of beneficial insects in prairie field crops, setting up a prairie region biovigilance network to protect against emerging insects and plant pests, collecting national farm statistics on greenhouse gas emissions for co and calf producers, and researching alternative feeds to reduce methane emissions in beef production. Prior to joining the Canadian government, Dr. Stevens was professor of economics at Pitzer College in Clemen, California, teaching agricultural economics, economic development, and microeconomic theory. She has been the economics editor for the Elsevier Journal Agricultural Systems since 2007. She got her PhD in economics from Cornell University in 2007. Hello, Emma. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> I said prairie many times that I never said in my life before. Oh, yeah, it's one of our uh, most unique ecosystems in Canada and the United States. It stretches across North America, and uh, yeah, it's very uh, it's very sensitive to climate change. So I have a lot to tell your your guests here about some of the questions you're going to ask about the prairies. So yeah. <laughs> It's big and flat. It's big and flat. That's, man, I should see if I can, well, anyway, if I find a good picture, I'll show you. <laughs> this area is also called the Great Plains, right? That's right. That's right. Okay, because I googled it a bit and uh, I found some info. Photos are amazing, by the way. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, I'll see what I can, uh, there's, there's lots. If I, if I Google prairies, you'll see. Because, well, it's the remains of an inland sea, so it's very, very flat. Okay, great. I'm very excited to hear about it more. Okay. So, I want to start with our first question. Okay. Uh, the first question is, what are the major issues at cross-section of climate change and agriculture? How the world leaders and governments react to these challenges? Okay, uh, yeah, this is a really uh, important question. And um, uh, and I think that uh, governments around the world are increasingly sensitive to this issue, um, in particular with respect to agriculture, because I think the agriculture uh, portfolio is really important to a lot of governments. And so uh, there's a lot of um, advanced research being done. Um, if you want, uh, Okay, I'm going to try technology. I'm going to try and share some of these initial things, but um, uh, just to see the depth of the research being done all over the world, you you could only have to look at the uh, International Panel on Climate Change, which assembles you know hundreds and hundreds of scholars uh, and research and policy briefs and all kinds of documents trying to look at. Uh, every dimension of climate change. So the group uh, at IPCC uh, that's working on agriculture specifically, I think it shows up in a lot of different um, research uh, tracks on IPCC, but group two um, is the one that's looking at climate change in land. And so they have these really big categories, but they've been incorporated the uh, research from all over the world on potential impacts of climate change on land use, including agriculture, but also, you know, other things like uh, uh, sea level rise and, and cities uh, managing uh, the impact on, on the land and things like that. So I'll see if I can, uh, shoot, we tried, we practiced yesterday. I'm just trying to remember <laughs> what we practiced. Okay. Okay. Chrome tab. All right. All right. Oh, I'm getting there. Okay. Here we go. Uh, I will try. Okay, so this doesn't, can you see that one? I hope. 
Yes, Does I can. It shows up. Okay, wonderful. Um, this so I, I, I won't be able to show you the whole thing, but uh, this is group two. So sometimes when you're navigating IPCC, um, it's hard to to get through it because there's so much there. But this is uh, climate change and land. So the special report and the research on desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, and food security, and greenhouse gas fluxes. So um, there's a lot of research. Uh, on the intersection of agriculture and all all of this, uh, uh, my federal ministry in Canada is very much interested in sustainable land management to make sure that we can maintain our agricultural production capacity, but also in a way that doesn't degrade our natural capital. So we recognize that climate change uh, is going to impact how we're able to uh, conduct agriculture in Canada. Um, and so we want to, a lot of the research at science and technology branch where I am is trying to both tackle mitigation. So can agriculture be used to mitigate the impacts of climate change? Uh, and it's interesting because it's both a source and a sink of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So uh, land, there's a lot of research from my colleagues on the sink capacity of uh, the prairies in particular, uh, the root systems. I have really cool colleagues. The root systems of all the plants are storing a ton of carbon. And uh, so they're doing a lot of research trying to figure out exactly how that works. Uh, can we measure it? Um, can we change the kinds of crops that we grow to uh, attract more carbon? So on mitigation, there's lots of um, different uh, avenues of research. And then adaptation is another very big question. Um, we know that uh, in the prairies in particular, um, there will be longer, a longer growing season. And so the crops that we have now may not be well suited to that changing environment. We have, they'll be in the field longer. Uh, what does that mean? Um, uh, where I am in Alberta, it's anticipated to be, it's very dry right now. We need irrigation to do agriculture here. It's anticipated to be wetter, but also more volatile. And so it's not a consistent rain. We will have big rainstorms and that is detrimental to, so I found my picture to um, uh, show you a little bit um, about uh, what it looks like, but a big rainstorm will wash away uh, important topsoil where all the nutrients live to conduct agriculture. So uh, there will definitely be uh, big impacts uh, of agriculture that we need to that we need to plan for. Um, okay, there we go. Hey, okay. All right, that's the <laughs> that's the theory. <laughs> um, and so uh, all of these uh, flat regions are are very. Um, susceptible. So we've we've done a lot of work already uh, in Canada and in the United States as well. Um, uh, in the 30s, uh, there wasn't as much known about uh, preserving topsoil. And so if you ever heard stories of North American agriculture in the 30s, it was notorious for these huge dust storms. Um, so they uh, they farmed and then they would till. Uh, and pull up the crops with uh, with these big tractors here and then leave the field open uh, and it dried out. It was a very dry period in the beginning of the depression and uh, like a, an enormous amount of the topsoil just blew away. So we now actually have done a lot of research on uh, no-till agriculture is another um, uh, technology that's good for agriculture in general, um, but it's also going to help us to uh, adapt to climate change because we're not disturbing the soil. So there's a, there's a, I've been a science and technology branch now, so I can go on about all of the really interesting work that's being done. Um, it does, uh, because agriculture portfolio in a lot of governments is, is pretty important. Uh, it's an important uh, ministry in, in many places. My feeling is that there is a lot of support from leadership and governments on making sure that uh, countries can continue to do agriculture, um, but it's definitely a sector um, uh, of the economy and our uh, production that is very susceptible. So uh, people recognize the risks. Uh, and there's always more, of course, 
that can be done. But my sense uh, is that um, uh, maybe in comparison to some other sectors, I think a lot of the research on mitigation and adaptation is is uh, is maybe a bit more advanced, just simply because it's a it's a it's a natural system and it's a sector economic sector that reply, relies on natural capital. So um, I, I believe uh, if you looked at the Ministry of Agriculture in Turkey, let's say, uh, I would guess that you would find scientists who are doing things that are similar to me, trying to understand how to both mitigate and adapt to climate change. Yes, exactly. When you mentioned this uh, nitrogen fixing crops, I remember the recent movie of Netflix. It's called Kiss the Ground. I don't know if you or the audience watched it. I haven't seen it. <laughs> no, uh, then I recommend it. If you have time, you can just see it. And they're talking about how the plants and crops actually like holding the nitrogen and putting it back to the soil and the importance of the quality of the soil for the like life on earth, actually. So maybe yeah. you can just check it out. And you're yeah. totally right that the research is been going on for quite a lot of time. It's uh, quite important, actually. Yeah. And there's also another technique about cover cropping. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Can you mention yeah. a little bit about it? Sure. <laughs> so, um, yes, that's another. Uh, uh, it's related to the problems with um, losing soil um, due to tillage uh, and sort of older practices. And so um, uh, you can, uh, when you harvest your crops, you can uh, do less disturbing methods. You just kind of take what, take the crop that you're actually collecting and you leave the stalks. So all of those uh, wheat fields, they, they would leave the stalks and those are the residues and you leave them in the field. So that's one way. Um, but other things you can do to even improve the soil while you're waiting for the next season is planting uh, cover crops. And so it, it also, um, uh, in addition to not disturbing the soil, you can plant legumes, uh, you know, beans, lentils, uh, peas, things like that, that not only they fix the nitrogen uh, and they maintain the structure of the soil, but they also, yeah, they add nutrients, they improve the biome of the soil. And so uh, for the uh, uh, support of governments, just that was sort of the direction that you were, you were wondering about, um, uh, there are subsidies, at least in Canada, on supporting farmers to do that. So there's there's costs associated with doing it. Uh, you have to buy the seeds, you have to maintain them. Uh, you're basically farming in the off season, um, or you have a rotation. So let's say they have like three big fields and they kind of switch which one is in production and which one isn't. So they have a constant stream of income, but they, they rotate around uh, so that they're not growing uh, the same thing on all three fields at the same time, but on the field that's out of production, um, we want to encourage not just leaving it alone, but uh, cover crops, uh, and we will provide subsidies to producers to uh, help them cover the costs of doing that because, yes, the soil is important for Earth, <laughs> and it's important for countries to maintain that resource, and it is um, it is a little scary, so this is not necessarily climate change, but some estimates, soil scientists think we probably have about 10 or 15 years left on productive soil, and then things will really change. So our options to grow food if we lose the soil uh, are very much more expensive. So greenhouse production, um, you know, uh, vertical systems, so there are all sorts of cool technologies on on that, but they do tend to be uh, quite expensive uh, because you have to supply the electricity and the water yourself. You're not getting it from Mother Nature. And so that would be a huge change in our food production capacity. So uh, the government in Canada anyway recognizes and provinces as well. There are different levels of government that support agriculture in different ways. Um, they will provide subsidies to encourage better practices because it's a it's a cost to producers, but it has an overall social benefit to it. So that's a that's another um, just one example of how government kind of intersects with agriculture um, to uh, to uh, plan for climate change and kind of uh, maintain that resource for everybody. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
this topic remind me reminded me that when uh, I was young at school, they were teaching us that like we have to leave, leave our field for one year to rest and recover. It's called nadaf in Turkish. Okay. And, uh, and now all of the permaculture um, movies and books that I'm reading, actually no one mentions a practice like that, leaving your soil for one year and doing nothing and then the next year like working on it again. Maybe it's not the best uh, practice anymore. I'm not an expert, of course, I cannot say this is the, the best one and this is the bad one, but maybe we should think about this um, practice and maybe we need to change it. And I want to share with you that we used to think, believe it was the best practice. Yeah. So it's yeah. interesting, actually. <laughs> Well, and, and there's so uh, agricultural scientists are all over the world going back to those older practices because uh, they they have a lot to recommend them. So there's a reason why uh, people did that. And then we were able to produce faster and not have to leave fields for a period of time. Um, but uh, scientists definitely want to uh, look at those old practices to get new ideas and say, OK, maybe we should do that again. What precisely is the benefit of doing that? Um, cover crops is kind of a compromise, I think. So you don't, you could kind of produce something to sell with a cover crop, or it could just strictly be uh, like a, a, a grass uh, that doesn't produce a food or anything like that. But it, it has the good properties of leaving this, not just leaving the soil alone, but but uh, doing a little bit uh, uh, on top of that. Um, uh, but we still in order to subsidize it. So I'm an economist, right? So it's interesting, like what, what's the amount of the subsidy that you should get? What's the price, you know? How much uh, do farmers need to really get them to incentivize them to, to do these practices? But we, we're still investigating. We, for that, we need to know how is one crop doing more nitrogen fixing than another crop, in which case we should subsidize that one more. Um, and it's very complicated to measure the precise, um, uh, those are known as uh, ecosystem services of different, different types of agricultural management uh, and how much we should encourage one over the other. So that's, um, so, so what, what someone would wanna do is say, okay, let's do an experiment and we'll leave this field and we'll see exactly what the state of the soil is after that. And then we can determine, you know, what, what did that do? How, if we want to encourage people to do that, then we, we can compensate them by knowing more about it. So, yeah. <laughs> you. So I want to go with the second question. Uh, as a Canadian scholar who lived more than a decade in Southern California, how do you compare sustainable agriculture innovations in the US and Canada? I also wanted to ask, is there any change caused by the changing presidents over time? Yeah, <laughs> yes. So uh, that's a good question. So uh, um, there's a agricultural economics journal in Canada called, you know, unsurprisingly, the uh, Canadian Agricultural Economics Journal. <laughs> uh, and they just put out a special issue about that uh, because um, Canadian and, uh, and American agricultural um, uh, systems are very connected by trade, um, by the uh, uh, the companies, the just very large, uh, like on beef production, uh, Cargill is one of the uh, major uh, companies that uh, produces ground beef and uh, beef products and things like that. Um, and they operate in Canada, United States, all over the world, really. It's a global company. And so by, for, for all those reasons, plus sharing same environments, so the Great Plains in the United States is the same as the prairies in Canada. Um, and so it matters who's in, who's in charge in both places, especially to Canada because we're a small country. So uh, changes in policy in the United States um, tend to have big impacts on us because we're much smaller than the United States, but that's one of our, our major markets for agriculture. So uh, we're, we're trying to see. It's too new maybe into the Biden administration to know exactly what's, what's the um, feeling going to be. But, uh, well, one, uh, one thing that uh, the previous administration in the U.S. 
was very um, protectionist. And so that's bad for Canadian agriculture. Um, uh, and trade negotiations with the United States were very uh, fraught, I guess you would say. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so uh, it seems like uh, the new administration is more willing to commit to trading arrangements, sort of more historical trading arrangements. That's probably going to be um, better for Canada. Um, in terms of research, uh, there's a, a ton of um, really great, uh, California in particular, the, the agricultural research being done um, uh, in California is, is, is top notch. It's a, it's a world leader on, uh, on scientists of the uh, scientists and economics of agriculture. Um, but it does, of course, uh, not always, but focus on California specific industry, which is a lot of fruits, vegetable horticulture, high value, um, uh, like oranges, strawberries, things like that, just because of the nature of the um, environment that they are in. So, so uh, we have great scientists in Canada too, but we're researching different, different stuff. So I do have uh, colleagues in British Columbia who are kind of maybe more on the same uh, area looking at sustainable production of uh, horticulture, uh, like apples and uh, tree crops and things like that. Um, but California really uh, is, is, a, is a leader, so agricultural scientists and economists around the world will, will get a lot out of the, the research that they do, especially on water management. I think uh, that's an issue in California, but it will be an issue going forward for everybody. Uh, and so learning from the experience of the agricultural researchers in California, I think, is going to become uh, more relevant as different places start to experience changes in water availability, for example. Um, so uh, for... Um, uh, at, I was looking at this question too, and I wasn't sure when you were talking about uh, innovation, uh, whether you meant like drones. So there's technological innovation, robots, like all kinds of uh, devices, um, smart agriculture, for example. So uh, systems that can uh, be more efficient in usage of water, uh, application of fertilizer, nutrients, pesticides, um, they're becoming more digitally connected. And then uh, farms now, smart farms, they, they are, are all, all these devices are like talking to each other. So you have the internet of things. And California definitely, again, um, there's an incentive to find these uh, efficiency improving technologies um, because they have water shortages uh, and they are in a sensitive environment. Um, but uh, other innovations are not machines and not technological. It's on the systems themselves. So how different crops interact with one another. So it's much more on um, uh, types of crops, on tillage practices, intercropping so i've gone to some pretty cool farmer field days out here where uh, farmers are growing wheat and peas or canola and peas or something like that all in the same field all at the same time and it looks messy so it, uh, historically farmers don't want a mess they want it to be very clear they can go they can harvest they know how much they're uh, producing and it's uh, kind of uh, separated, but uh, newer farmers are innovating on, uh, well, if you change your machine, so some of the crops are tall and some of them are short, so you can put those two crops together, harvest them with a special machine and get the advantage. So let's say the one down here fixes nitrogen and this is your wheat, then you don't have to apply as much fertilizer. So there's a lot of innovation like that also. Um, so I wanted to show you um, <clears throat> another, so on the, on the prairies, this is very much a, a concern. Um, and uh, um, 
So uh, the Prairie Climate Center, for example, is trying to uh, think about uh, climate risks with, with uh, respect to the prairies, but also what um, what kinds of innovation we can make to um, uh, to better produce, more efficiently produce with minimal environmental impact. So uh, some of the innovation is on information sharing. So yeah, I guess I wanted to show you um, uh, this. Oops, where's the atlas? Okay, now, <sighs> so some of the, some of the uh, issues are that farmers need, need to know. Um, they, uh, they may not have information. Uh, they make choices every day uh, about, oh dear, it's like links upon links. Hang on, let me see if I can find a better link here. But they, they make choices every day on their, on their uh, operations. And so um, uh, giving them more information using uh, technological uh, 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 tools that we have. Um, oh, here we go, I succeeded. Can help, um, can help them too. So innovation comes in a lot of different forms. It's not just uh, <clears throat> digital. So, uh, okay, I think I, I think I got it now. <laughs> Return to the map. But if you want to look at uh, predicting um, what pathway we're on uh, in terms of uh, very hot days, this is a variable that uh, that they've mapped out here <sighs> over time. Uh, and uh, I'm down here. This is where I uh, live and work in Alberta, um, and. Lethbridge is where my research station is. Um, oh, sorry, that's a, a, a project to um, uh, reintroduce native uh, livestock species. Um, but you can look at how it's going to change. So this is uh, the number of very hot days in the recent past. Um, not very many. We have uh, cold weather agriculture here. This impacts the viability of your uh, production. Uh, these uh, hot days uh, will burn up your crops and is presenting a risk for farmers. And if you want to project with this uh, tool into the future, uh, it's going to change dramatically. All, this is all the prairie region here. Uh, and this is something that we're going to have to continue to innovate on. Can we put different crops here? Um, that's one choice. Uh, some crops are better suited to dry, hot uh, degree days than others. So the ones we have uh, were actually developed at the turn of the 20th century to deal with the cold. So those may not be suitable anymore. Um, we can uh, try to innovate on irrigation. So the irrigation zone in Alberta is, is, is down here south of, south of Calgary, but we may need to invest in water delivery systems up here, but that's going to impact the water uh, watersheds that are available uh, in other um, in other areas. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of innovation happening, but a lot that we still uh, don't know about. Um, what are the best choices on all these different dimensions of agriculture uh, that can make sure that we can continue to produce agriculture? Uh, but uh, in a way that is has a long-term perspective. So those are that's some of the innovations that are happening. And California maybe faced that a little bit earlier than other places because they're already uh, drier and hotter than they used to be. Thank you very much. Uh, I got the feedback that my voice is echoing. So maybe can you try muting yourself, Emma, while you're not talking? Yeah. Let's see, this is the solution, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So the just to wrap you up, like the research being done and like great things are going, like the uh, website you're showing is like a great resource for the farmers and producers in Canada. I hope like it will be spread around the world. And there's also a thing that uh, it reminded me like, the research is being done in universities and in the academies, but maybe we should like getting more like this uh, policymakers and the uh, researchers together to make the policies and find the solutions, just not to leave it in the 
science in the academia and just uh, put them into the real life you know just not not like writing papers and papers and that's it we really need to come together actually and work together on these i really hope like this uh, policy makers around the world like listen to these academicians more and with this new technologies uh, like you said like with the machine it can reach the here and there so you can like um, harvest two different types of crops maybe this can be solution to the monoculture because like currently we're uh, seeing that farmers are doing monoculture because it's easier easier to uh, plant easier to crop uh, harvest the crop so maybe this can be also the solution to go from the uh, monoculture to intercropping maybe so i want to go on with the third question because we're really uh, going super fast like i mean in the time so the global food security is a major concern in the 21st century the economist even created an index which ranks countries according to their performance in food availability affordability and quality and safety covid 19 pandemic has even worsened the situation for example in turkey we experience about 20 percent food inflation which is five percent above the consumer price index how do you see food security in developing countries do you also think that developed countries are exempt from the concerns so but um uh yes i uh no one is exempt uh so um one thing i guess I, i'll try not to talk so so much i i talk too much but um i wanted to show you uh and the people at the at your session here uh the um FAO state of food and nutrition security around the world. <clears throat> and uh, this is the latest report from last year. And uh, no, no one is exempt. You will find food and nutrition security uh, issues um, uh, everywhere. Uh, and globally, it's increasing. So the FAO is, uh, is sounding the alarm about um, we were making a lot of progress uh, on uh, tackling food insecurity. It's one of the sustainable development goals, uh, the zero hunger by 2030. And uh, given the trends, it's been on the rise, you can see here since uh, 2014 plus COVID-19 has been a huge shock and backward step on our progress towards uh, meeting the uh, sustainable development goal on zero hunger by, by 2030. And now it's, uh, it's in jeopardy. So um, a lot of the most food insecure people, especially in, uh, in low income uh, places, uh, tend to be uh, in agriculture as their main uh, livelihood. Um, and so there are lots of um, shocks hitting them all at once. COVID is a, is a shock. Uh, uh, climate change is, is a shock for sure, uh, limiting their capacity to uh, produce food. Um, and so uh, it's definitely, uh, there, there's a lot of risk uh, to food security and it's going up particularly in low, low income places. So um, <clears throat> uh, the problems are the challenges, I guess, on food security, are, they do vary across different countries and different uh, income levels. So if you have uh, uh, producers that are on small farms, let's say um, they produce a lot of what they eat themselves and then those resources are becoming less uh, productive, that's gonna impact their food security. Um, economic uh, volatility in general, a lot of farmers everywhere in the world rely a lot on off-farm income so they don't, uh, Everything that they need, they can't always, you know, produce it on their farms. In which case, they need to uh, have a combination of uh, producing food and also being able to buy food in the market, and um, that is uh, more at risk, both with with COVID and sort of the the economic shocks uh, associated with that. That means there's less uh, off farm jobs available, less income available, and so that's those are other other threats. Um, uh, COVID uh, in particular. So people who work off farm in some, some places, they have to travel uh, quite a bit. So they, they're in a rural area, but their off farm uh, uh, job is in the city. 
Uh, but COVID actually had a lot of specific restrictions on people moving around. And so people suddenly lost access to uh, employment that was uh, really important for, for their food security. So um, uh, that those for already vulnerable people, big shocks like that uh, will definitely um, uh, be impacting food security uh, in the future. So there are um, innovations in, in sustainable agriculture. So at the same time, there, there's a lot of research being done, again, on, on agricultural systems in all over the world, trying to make it more resilient, uh, maybe not to COVID. COVID really surprised uh, everyone, uh, but there is actually some good news. So um, uh, I'm the editor at uh, Agricultural Systems, and we are just finishing almost a special issue on COVID and agricultural systems around the world. And so you'll see uh, reports from everywhere, uh, all, all uh, continents um, uh, where agriculture is being done. Um, and uh, there are definitely shocks, um, but also uh, a surprising amount of resilience. And so people, uh, farmers around the world were able to find new new customers. They were able to uh, find new ways to um, uh, interact with, uh, with markets. And so they were able to protect themselves. So there is some, some uh, uh, good things that we learned about the resilience of farming systems um, to big shocks and how that's gonna impact food security. But, um, but yeah, people are increasingly worried. Um, high income places are definitely not immune. Um, the issues uh, are slightly different. Not uh, not as many people are in the agricultural sector and in a high income place, and they don't rely on being a farmer to to guarantee food security. So it's more income related, um, uh, and uh, so. Uh, but you will have big pockets of low income um, folks who who don't have access to food simply because. Uh, the wages that they earn uh, from their labor don't uh, pay for food. So you mentioned high uh, increase in uh, food price inflation, and that will be a, a big risk for food security just because uh, nothing else is going up at the, at the same pace. So your wages are not going up 20% to compensate for the food inflation. And so that's going to uh, increase the food insecurity for, for folks uh, that are in uh, employment, if it, they may have lost the, their jobs as well. So there's been a big increase in Canada also in use of uh, food banks and uh, other kind of food safety net, food safety nets to do uh, with the COVID situation. Um, uh, but uh, there are uh, large, large groups of food insecure people in high income places. Um, uh, quality is another concern. So uh, the FAO is sort of made the general comment that uh, now most people in the world, not everyone, but most people can find sufficient calories to eat uh, so they can get the energy requirements that they need, but it's not the highest quality. And that's, that is a problem uh, almost everywhere too. So you can access starches and uh, cheap uh, calories, but you can't find fresh fruits and vegetables. You can't find higher quality uh, nutritious food because the market where you are is either too expensive or there isn't a, a, a good supermarket near you. So um, uh, those are additional food security issues on top of the, the calories that are that are of concern. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, going forward, with all the other things we've already talked about, um, uh, people are starting to recognize the interrelationship between food security and uh, environmental sustainability of, of food production and we need to more better align our food production systems with food security and the and the environment so um, this is a uh, a report from the lancet oh, that's the fao but i'll share this other thing from the lancet on sustainable diets Okay, so uh, recognizing that um, uh, the Earth is a closed system, so <laughs> we need to we need to recognize that uh, we um, we need to produce food in a way uh, that 
respects the uh, the overall production capacity of 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 the earth. So, uh, oh, here it is. Sorry. Um, and so this is a very interesting report as well. Uh, sustainable food systems. Okay, so it's trying to bring all those pieces together. And I, as my, and as part of my research, I'm very interested in in trying to link up the agricultural science and the agricultural production with the food security questions because there are choices that we can make that can make both better. Um, but if we don't think about them at the same time in the systems uh, framework, um, then we may increase risk of food insecurity or uh, production uh, issues um, that going into the future. So um, I guess if folks are interested in that, I would recommend taking a look at, uh, at this report. I've got some kind of cool graphics here. So they, they've tried to, you know, they have, it's, it's a very big study and they have to make a lot of um, assumptions to put it all together, but this is the intake recommended in the reference diet. So if they could make it so that everyone ate this reference diet to maintain global boundaries, this is sort of where we would be, but we have intake levels of different kinds of food that go beyond the plant, what they're estimating to be the planetary boundaries. So we've got to like shift these columns so that we're kind of on the left side of this, this line. This is what they're recommending. So uh, it's going to take a whole systems approach to make those transformations happen. So that's also pretty interesting as well. But uh, uh, definitely um, uh, countries around the world, everywhere, you will still find food insecurity. That's why it was one of the development goals, um, but we still haven't fixed it yet. So that's, uh, that's uh, an unfortunate reality. Yes, when you mentioned the, this was like, can you mute again? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, when you mentioned this food insecurity is actually uh, can be seen in, in developed countries as well. It reminded me this Food Inc. movie. It was a um, diet like it, it was in the movies, I think, in 2008. And they were like uh, showing families from US, like low income families. They could not afford like fresh fruits, but they could buy like one hamburger menu and it was like cheaper, maybe one dollar. So in order to get full, they were choosing, let's say, burger over the apple so that they could just like end the day, you know. But then this also always leads to obesity, cardiovascular diseases. It's also then the ultimate version is, is like metabolic syndrome that you see all of the diseases all together, just like it also depends on like the just sitting all the time and eating over uh, calories, like calorie, not deficit, but like over calories. It's also mentioned it's more like uh, income based, not like production in the developed countries. It was like good to mention. Also, like one of our audience asked a question related with this documentary. They said, we saw uh, companies are able to have the license or copyright of modifying seeds. It was filmed in 2008, right? And I'm wondering if there's any progress on the legal side of food and agriculture ethics. Since 2008 till uh, 2021, was there any difference in the ethics? Really good question, a big question. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if the commenter was talking about, uh, there's a, by Vandana Shiva, she's like a food justice activist in India, I think. She's a global uh, person, so maybe yeah. that's who just, uh, the proprietary nature of the breeding versus the farmers. Um, uh, I uh, So, You'd have to look country by country on their rules on uh, how they manage those copyrights. It is really interesting. Uh, Canada, um, we invest in crop breeding too, uh, both on the public and the, there's public and, and private. So wheat varieties that were bred in, I was saying, in Canada for the cold weather. So the wheat varieties that existed at the turn of the 20th century couldn't survive in Canada because the, the temperature got too low in the winter 
and, uh, and the, the growing season is too short. And so the Canadian government invested in a crop breeding program and we still have many crop breeders at the, science, at the research station where I work now along that tradition, but that is public do domain. So those varieties were then given to the farmers to help them farm better. So, but there are other crops. So canola has been a more private driven breeding program and they have proprietary rights to uh, the, the investment that they make in crop breeding. On, on the ethics of all that, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to talk about it. I know that um, uh, some of the distress, economic distress associated with not being able to uh, uh, cover the risks associated with, with uh, the crops. Uh, I, I did read a report recently, I think that uh, the issues in India that prompted that documentary, I think they have gotten better. I don't know whether it's a resolution of the ethical issues or other su supports or other uh, ways of managing the risk associated with going into, uh, uh, into growing those crops. I, but I do uh, recall reading that some of those issues are not as pronounced as they used to be, so that's good news. Um, but uh, yeah, who owns the innovation is uh, is an important is an important question, and I think it's another intersection between government, agriculture, private sector. Everyone needs to kind of be working together to make sure we maintain agriculture in the fa in the face of climate change. Um, but yeah, those those relationships are always under under negotiation. So I don't know if we I don't know globally or Canada if we resolve the ethics or not, but it is a really important thing to keep in mind, especially uh, public sector um, uh, cares about that. Um, but it's a, it's a constant question. I agree. But I don't know if we are doing better. But I think that some of the issues that prompted that documentary I have read, those are not as severe as they used to be. So that's some good news there. Thank you. I want to go with my last question. Uh, in one of your earlier studies, you examined the food crisis in the Sahel region of Africa. What steps should be taken to fight against famine? There are millions of ch children were at risk from severe malnutrition. How do you see the role of agri-tech in this issue? Uh, yeah, I. it's interesting. So famines are really complicated uh, problems uh, in terms of uh, how they arrive. So uh, it's not just technology, it's not just supply side. So that was in the in the 80s, uh, there's a great um, uh, economist, a uh, Nobel Prize winner named Amartya Sen, and a lot of the work he got the Nobel Prize for was for recognizing that famines are uh, a distribution problem, not a supply problem in terms of food. So globally, there is enough food, you know. Uh, when you have a famine, it's a localized event. Uh, it means more, It there was a local failure on supply, let's say, there's a, a drought or uh, some unexpected uh, event, but it also means that that locality is not well connected to other places that aren't suffering the same problem and the food can't get there. So um, what can technology do to that? So uh, technology, if it improves resilience, then we can uh, minimize the number of local local based uh, events, shocks that uh, destroy supply. So that's one that's one way. Um, but uh, as uh, in in the question um, you pointed out, some of my research is on the other part of that, which is on the market distribution networks. And uh, that's not so much a technological issue uh, as a kind of a, a commitment to making sure that um, places remain connected uh, by, by trade and food. So I'm sharing this um, uh, map here. This is uh, uh, something called FuseNet, which is I think also part of FAO. Now I'm, now I'm blanking, or it might be the United Nations, shoot. 
Oh, well, no, it's supported by the USAID, but there's other um, participants there. So I um, just wanted to bring up this map. Um, try, so this is trying to put together all of the different factors that can potentially lead to a famine. So looking at um, uh, where there are production risks plus other kinds of insecurities that will cut off these regions from being able to access food. So some of these, if you want to click on a on a specific place, um, uh, like uh, say El Salvador, I'll give you this big report on why we are monitoring. Oh shoot, it's in Spanish. I'm sorry about that. Um, why uh, we're uh, monitoring uh, what's going on? Okay, I'm afraid I don't speak Spanish. So I'm going to try to find a country that I can help interpret a little bit better. Let's see. Well, Nigeria. Um, is interesting. So Nigeria has a lot of production capacity. So here's a map of Nigeria. Uh, but the kind of concern about um, uh, food insecurity and famine uh, changes. And uh, so in this northern part, this is an area of Nigeria that is uh, suffering from a lot of political violence. There are uh, violent groups here that are disrupting um, uh, the economic life and the political life of people who live in this area. So it's, you can't maintain a constant supply of food. You can't maintain a trading network when uh, the trading networks are, are being attacked. So this is this uh, north uh, east region of, of Nigeria often shows up on this map. Um, but the conditions look good. Uh, it's a good growing season for the rest of Nigeria, but that doesn't really matter because the political violence is meaning that food from all these other places can't can't get into this region and make sure that there's um, less food insecurity there. So I think that's a good um, uh, illustration of why uh, why we can't just focus on technology and production. You can have a good year, but still have these pockets of food insecurity that are driven by other factors besides uh, besides agriculture. So. Uh, yeah, they're talking about uh, inflation. So this is something you mentioned in one of your other questions. Um, this has uh, been high in Nigeria, um, uh, and that'll drive food insecurity, but it doesn't have anything to do with agricultural production. Um, uh, income opportunities are um, limited in the Northeast because of these uh, uh, conflicts uh, in the area. Uh, Banditry, kidnapping, communal conflict uh, is is driving a lot of the insecurity in the in the northwest as well. So this other pocket um, that is uh, at risk, um, uh, but uh, other parts of the country are doing well. So um, it's uh, it's it's really complicated on what what you can do. Um, what technology can can do to resolve that, but. Yeah. Uh, on the plus side, um, minimizing risk and increasing resilience. Um, I, I, in my notes that I sent to you guys, uh, there is research on the relationship going the other way. So um, some it's circular. So some of the violence and the conflict is driven by food insecurity. So violence and conflict causes food insecurity, but food insecurity is caused by, you know what I mean? So there's a there's an incentive to use technology, use all of our research to stabilize agriculture because there's a, there's a possibility it can minimize conflicts as well uh, because food is such an important um, uh, yeah. thing for everyone. So uh, if you have food insecurity, it causes a lot of other uh, conflicts. And so we can, we can address that with agriculture, which is kind of the new realization it's not just the other way around so yeah exactly also like there are also lots of factors that are um causing food insecurity like like you mentioned conflict climate change economic situation food distribution like overconsumption in some parts of the world and like under uh, production in some other parts maybe also like increasing demand for some um, stuff let's say avocados and quinoa and maybe mangoes let's say in like some parts of the world are like demanding over and over and the other 
producing countries are have to like go with deforestation to have more lands and going monoculture just to keep up with the demand of the let's say developed world so that's also another topic like brings us the importance of eating sometimes local food and like uh, buying just enough not eating a lot not over consumption and uh, being uh, careful about like everyday uh, choices of every person actually we could just maybe summar up summarize like that we're running out of time uh, i'm just gonna take just one more question i'm so sorry about our like friends who wrote questions actually so i'm just gonna check and uh, there's a question about the small scale scale farming us and canada do you think about family family farming and climate change what do you think about it and the relation with the food security that's a really good question i um uh, uh the special issue that i mentioned that was one of the bright points is small scale family farming and these short uh, value chains so these small farm operations that have relationships with their customers you know they they were quite resilient to covid is sort of an unexpected um finding um just we never got tested in that way um but uh they they are more nimble so when when things happen they can find solutions maybe more easily than these like bigger operations that are kind of locked in. They have efficiencies and economies of scale, but they are, it's like a big boat. It's hard for them to like, move when there's a shock. So climate change um, uh, is possible that these uh, smaller operations will find local solutions to climate change. Like what's going on specifically on their farm, they'll be able to think about it and adjust their operation to to some extent so uh there's a recognition for sure um well with food security it's complicated because you you need both i think i guess i would put it you need a diverse ecosystem of farm types so you need the small family farm but they are small so they can't feed everybody in their potential like area where they where they are operating so you need you need the bigger farms to produce food relatively cheaply to keep food security issues in in check um, but you need the small farms to uh to also innovate uh and be more resilient to to shocks so you i think you it's like a eco uh model i guess is how i think about it is that they both have a role to play these big big producers and the small producers i think but i think uh so knowing what the, the uh, the the network uh, uh i'm gonna mess it up um sue boston no <laughs> the network that you're working on uh is, is doing is really great so technology can can make it easier for the small farms to be in the ecosystem so they're not as marginalized so they can kind of be together you can give them some tools to also be in the broader picture of, of providing food and and helping with food security so i think i think they they have a lot of resilience, which we should support and uh, and value and study. We need to still study, like how are they making these quick changes and 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 surviving all these big shocks. We can learn a lot uh, from these smaller operations um, uh, and uh, and improve both kind all kinds of farms by looking at what they're doing. Yeah. Like maybe a little bit related with it. There was a question about the effects of uh, agriculture on the climate change. Maybe you can just mention a few words about it and then we can uh, wrap up and close. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I went over time. But um, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, agriculture is an emitter of uh, greenhouse gases for sure. Uh, uh, CO2 and uh, the biggest source is uh, usually uh, uh, artificial fertilizer. So mm -hmm. the production of fertilizer, uh, right now the way we do it uses a lot of fossil fuels and our alternatives like manure or green manure or t you know tillage or all these other things, they are not as uh, good at delivering the, the nitrogen to the plants. So those are, that's one of the biggest sources. Um, methane also from uh, beef production is a source. Uh, and so uh, there's efforts to to minimize that. So I mentioned in my bio that I'm working with uh, researchers on finding ways 
to, to mitigate climate change in all these different sectors. So uh, there's all sorts of interesting work. If you feed seaweed to cows, you can reduce methane emission from cows by you know 70%. It's pretty amazing, but you need to figure out, well, can the cows eat that long term? So it's it's so there's a lot of thought that we are trying to do, but we don't know. Um, and then the other thing on, on agriculture specifically is that it does have the capacity to absorb greenhouse gases. Um, it can be a sink. Uh, and so we want to also do research to build up the capacity of agriculture to provide that ecosystem service. So not just it's not just an emitter, it also can absorb greenhouse gases from, from the air and from the atmosphere uh, if we choose the right choose the right system. So some plants, some cover crops, um, some production systems are better at doing that than others. So there's there's definitely reason. But yeah, it's. Uh, I wish I could say we do. We knew what to do. We're still trying to figure out what is the best, what has the most um, capacity. So uh, there's there's still big questions about how how it how it is doing that. It's kind of like it, I. I have a colleague who's a microbiologist, and it's all about the little tiny um, microphages on the roots themselves. Not the roots, actually. It's like these little creatures on the roots that are like actually eating the carbon. It's just really nuts. So <laughs> trying to characterize exactly how much of that is going on is is still a big question, but we're trying to work on it. I have just one little question. So you mentioned you are you were working about on the economic value of uh, beneficial insects. Is it only for in like crops wise, or is it a kind of potential food that they could be potential food that you're also investigating, or you're just looking for the uh, plants and crops? Well, when you want to capture both the on farm direct impact to the farmer themselves but also the broader ecosystem services that they provide and figure out um, how, to, how to allocate those, that number. So you wanna support pollinators, you wanna support lady beetles, um, not just to help uh, minimize pesticide application on farm, but also um, uh, in uh, surrounding areas, around agricultural areas. They, they, have, a, they have a large range. So yeah, there's um, uh, it matters it matters where the benefits happen because then that sort of determines who's going to do the work of preserving the lady beetles, right? So if if all the benefits go to the farmer, mo mostly go to the farmer, then you can like work with the farmer and say, look, this lady beetle is like eating all of your predators. You know, you have to put a strip around your farm to make sure you have a habitat for the lady beetle. So, but um, but it's probably not going to work out that way. It'll be a combination of on-farm benefits and then overall environmental benefits. You want to capture both. And then other organizations. So we don't have one for lady beetles. I wish, I wish we did. We have other organizations in Canada um, on uh, uh, prairie birds. So there's a, it's called Ducks Unlimited. They work a lot with farming communities to preserve uh, ponds and water features uh, because they recognize the broader ecosystem services provided by birds and the farmers without working with groups like that don't have an incentive to preserve those wetland areas that are part of their um at the boundary of their farm so we need something similar to that for all the different all the different species you know to uh, to work with land managers to to pr preserve those that biodiversity while they are also producing food and producing food security. So it's very, very complicated. <laughs> who, who, who gets, who, who, where did the support going to come from to, uh, to get those, to increase that biodiversity, to provide those ecosystem services? It's gonna be a combination of private sector and public sector. Yeah, currently, for example, we also have this campaign to, um, protect bees, for example, because they're endangered now in Turkey. So we have the same like uh, research about the effects of the bees, but uh, I'm not that informative about the other pests and uh, 
insects yeah. have their effects on the farm well i know that they're working for the like protecting the bees yeah we recognize that better now and try to creatively find ways to protect them so it's it's all minimizing pesticide usage but it's also habitat you can't like like the ponds like you have to maintain these grasslands and areas where they can live um a colleague of mine made a point the other day that they live next to farms because uh, lady beetles lady beetles will kill all the bugs will eat what <laughs> they find and they're really amazing ladybugs um but uh that that's during the growing season and then what are they you need to provide somewhere for them to be and find food in the winter when they don't have the crops and the pests and stuff to eat. so um uh yeah it, it's uh there are many different ways to increase the biodiversity all these different choices we can make uh mm -hmm. but put a, put a number on it to get people to really kind of reflect on how much they do i think we just they were working in secret and we didn't realize and now now we do so <laughs> yeah <laughs> Thank you very much, Emma, for joining us today. I know that you have such a busy schedule, so I don't want to prolong it more. I know there's so much stuff to talk about, and it's always so much fun. And yeah. fruitful, of course, not fun, but fruitful. But uh, I have to end it here. I also sure. want to thank you, our uh, simultaneous um, yeah, I want to thank Tuba Anil yeah. for yeah. the her hard work as well. Thank yeah. you also, also our um, participants for this uh, Sunday evening joining us here on Super Peer. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It's been great. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me, and I I hope it was useful. And uh, yeah, I, I I'm I'm glad to 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 know about your work also. So it's great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.